May that be our heart's cry. Would you bow with me and let's pray before we get into God's word. Father, we need you in this world, in this day, with our lives the way they are, we need you. And so we've gathered together, we have lifted your name in song, we've sung words of truth. But now, Lord, we need to worship you by hearing your voice. And we need for you to feed us with your living and active word. And so I pray for us now, Father, that you would feed your hungry sheep. I pray that you would take this, your living and active word, and make it come alive in our minds and in our hearts and in our wills. Lord, transform our wills. Make them wholly yours. And to that end, I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit as I seek to faithfully expound your holy word. Pray that you would fill these lips with your words, and that they would go forth with your power, nothing more, nothing less than what you would have said. And I pray for all who are listening now, all who are opening their own Bibles to follow along. And I pray, Father, that you would speak to us and let us know that we're hearing your powerful voice and your voice of love to guide us through the challenges of the days in which we live. Would you do this all in Jesus' name and because of him? I pray these things in his name. Amen. Would you take your Bibles, please, and turn in them to the Old Testament book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings and the very first chapter. We began a study, a journey through this, what I think is a far too often neglected book of the Old Testament, one with so much to say to us today that speaks into our situation with the force and power that only God's living word can have. And so I want us to journey through this book and hear God's voice as he speaks to us in these days in which we live. First Kings chapter 1, we began the journey last week. We got as far as verse 10. We're going to pick up the rest of chapter 1 this morning. And let's begin by reading just verses 11 to 14. And we'll pick up the rest as we go along. But First Kings chapter 1, starting at verse 11. Then Nathan said to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king, and David, our Lord, does not know it? Now, therefore, come. Let me give you advice that you may save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. Go in at once to King David and say to him, Did you not, my lord the king, swear to your servant, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? Why then is Adonijah king? Then while you are still speaking with the king, I also will come in after you and confirm your words. This is the word of the Lord, and may he add his blessing to the reading of it. Well, the most famous prayer in the history of the world is the one that Jesus taught his disciples. Remember, they asked him how to pray in the Gospels, and and he taught them. We know it as the Lord's Prayer. Really, it's the disciples' prayer as taught by the Lord. But you remember how it begins. Our Father, who art in heaven, focus in the right place, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And ever since Jesus taught us how to pray, Christians who have a living relationship with Jesus Christ, who have experienced this world, who have drunk deeply from the misery of life outside of a relationship with God and the Lord of the universe, Christians who have tasted the misery of sin, whether their own in their own life or the results of the choices of evil made by others done, done to them, but those who have tasted and seen in contrast to that evil that, that the Lord is good 
And by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, they know what it is to enjoy life as a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. The scaly old skin of sin has been sloughed off and left behind. And now forgiveness and freedom has come. And your relationship now with the God of heaven has been restored. But not just restored, but added to so much more. Because no longer are you just a servant of of God. Now you are a child of the loving, sovereign, all-powerful Father, God of heaven. And with the joy that that new life be- brings to you, you can't help but want the whole world to know this joy too. Is, is that your heart, Christian? And so Christians have been praying ever since Jesus taught that prayer, ever since the time of Christ, God, your kingdom come here. And as long as Christians have been praying that prayer, we've been living in a world where it's tempting to wonder whether or not God's kingdom will ever come. Let me ask you this this morning. You ever feel like we as Christians are on the wrong side of history? I know the right answer, and you know the answer you're supposed to give, but how do you feel in your heart? You ever feel like Christians are ending up on the wrong side of history? You look at the news media, you look at government discussions and decisions, and you wonder, what's the future for the church, especially in this society, especially in this day? In popular circles, Christianity has been rejected. At very best, it's treated as an, an, a relic of an ancient, pre-enlightened, superstitious time. You tell somebody you're a Christian and they say, oh, you're a Christian. You can see the look of surprise mixed with a little bit of disdain and trying to hold it all in because they didn't think that you were that naive. At worst, your Christian faith is treated as intolerant and dangerous and an impediment to a society that's trying and straining to move forward to a new glorious age of progress. And you want to say, if you're a Christian, hang on a second, don't you know history? Don't you know that the bedrock of human rights and freedom and dignity comes out of the soil of the Bible with humans created in the image of God as the Bible teaches and Jesus Christ as the ultimate manifestation of who God is in his love as well as his holiness and his self-sacrifice for the sake of people? You take Christianity out of the picture, friend, and what's the foundation for your blissful idea of a society of pro? progress. And yet you also wonder, is there coming a time when the whole world turns its back on Christianity? Maybe you're wondering that today. You need to recognize, friend, if that's where you're at, that God's kingdom often passes through precarious moments when the future seems almost hopeless. Let's think of just a a, a few short examples here. Joseph, remember Joseph, who had risen to become prime minister of Egypt, saves the nation from starvation, saves his family from starvation, brings them to safety in Egypt, and then Pharaoh dies, Joseph dies, and a new Pharaoh rises up who doesn't know Joseph and can't stand his family and enslaves his people. Things seemed hopeless then. Or there was a time of Moses. Remember Moses, he leads his people out of Egypt slavery, leads them faithfully through 40 years in a barren wilderness filled with challenges and trials and hostility on every side, and Moses dies just outside the border of the promised land he's been leading them to for four decades. It was a precarious time. Or successor Joshua. Joshua takes the reins. He leads the people into conquest in the promised land. And then he dies. And a new generation rises up that doesn't know the Lord or what he has done for Israel. The times were precarious. Well, 1 Kings begins in a time like that. Remember, 1 Kings is a story of God's kingdom at the very beginning looking like it's doing anything but advancing. 
Because right at the very beginning of this book, you remember from last week, we have David. David, heroic, mighty, warrior, protector, man of faith, heart for God, conquering enemies. King David is on his deathbed. He's put Israel on the map. He's made it a nation to be noticed among the international community. He's only the second king of the nation, and the first one was a complete disaster. So as he's lying on his deathbed, do you see how precarious things are for God's people right here? One wrong move, one bad turn, and there's going to be disaster for God's fledgling nation. And while this king is lying almost lifeless, not long for this world, there is, just outside the palace, an ambitious prince who's trying to take David's throne before he's even dead, Adonijah. He's the oldest living son of King David. And even though God has already made it clear that his choice is Adonijah's younger half-brother Solomon, that that's the king who's going to take David's place and carry on the royal line. We learned that from 1 Chronicles. And even though Adonijah knows surely that David has promised the throne to Solomon, none of that matters because this young man, Adonijah, he's on one of those young guys who grew up idolizing his dad but for all the wrong reasons. Adonijah looks up to his dad, but not for his faith, not for his heart after God, not because of the psalms he writes and sings from the bottom of his heart of worship. No, Adonijah fell in love with his dad for the perks of power that his dad enjoyed. He watched the way that people revered his dad. As a kid growing up, he saw the way that people would bow in respect and submission every time dad walked by. He heard the old songs on the radio about his dad's conquest, killing his tens of thousands. He saw the way his dad was able to order people around and they would do what he said or else. And he saw the palace, all oh, the wonders and the lavish luxury of the palace. I and I just sees all of that and he says, I want that for me. So what do you do when your nation is the people of God and they're about to inherit a king that has no use for God? A king who's all about self and self-aggrandizement and grabbing for himself. What does it do to your hope for the future when the highest level of government is about to be held by a man who's all about self-centered agendas? You feel that sense of hope that the people in David's day would be experiencing right now, the hopelessness? What do you do? You pray. And see what happens in our passage this morning. God's people trust God and they get to work. Our story begins this morning in verse 11 with Nathan, the prophet, stepping up. He shows up at Bathsheba's doorstep for an impromptu visit in verse 11. Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king and David, our Lord, does not know it? You see David's full weakness on display here. Remember, this legendary, once mighty warrior and conquering king who subdued all of Israel's enemies, he's mighty no more. In fact, he's not even able to keep his own body warm under the covers of his bed without a beautiful young woman lying next to him. And there's a word play in our text that I want to make sure you don't miss. Adonijah has become king and David our Lord does not know it. Go back to verse 4. See the end of verse 4. It ends with a description of Abishag and her beauty. But the king knew her not. The king knew her not. That's knowing in the intimate sense of a husband knowing his wife. David did not know Abishag. And now Nathan says in verse 11 that David does not know what's going on in his own kingdom. So just down the street from his palace where his son is grasping for the throne before dad is even dead. This is all going on right on under his nose and David doesn't have a clue. 
So you see here this picture of David, impotent in every way. Sexually, intellectually, he is powerless, he is weak, and we have a crisis point for David right here. How is he going to go out? Is he going to go out and exit the stage of this life? Is he going to go out strong? Mighty King David? Will he end his story in full control of the nation God made him king over, strongly, firmly, passing the baton on to the next generation and directing their path before he says goodbye? Or is David going to fade away? Is he going to be like those Olympic bloopers we've seen in the relay race where the passer of the baton doesn't quite get it right, drops the baton, and the race is over? Is David going to fade away in ignorance and impotence and weakness just fading and fading and fading. Well, Nathan's determined to keep him on track and to lead him by the hand if that's necessary so he crosses the finish line and ends well. And the prophet tells Bathsheba, pay the king a visit, remind him of the promise he made that Solomon, her son, was to be king after him. Now put yourself in Bathsheba's place right now. Just because she is a queen, just because she's David's wife, doesn't mean that he's going to want to hear what she has to say. Doesn't mean he cares to hear her opinion. Remember, this king has other wives, and clearly Bathsheba doesn't even share his bed at this point. There's no telling what the reaction from David to her will be, but this situation is deadly serious. Adonijah's parting with all his brothers we read last week, except Solomon. So why is only one sibling not invited? Well, it's because Abishag knows David's promise. He knows God's plan. He knows that Solomon has been chosen to take David's throne and lead lead God's people into the next generation. And Solomon's presence at Adonijah's party would give the lie to what this usurping brother is claiming at his feast. And if Adonijah sees him as a threat now, before he has the power, you better be sure that he's going to take the very first chance he has to get rid of Solomon and his mom to make his own throne secure and Nathan gets how serious the situation is so verse 12 now therefore come let me give you advice that you may save your own life and the life of your son Solomon so what does Bathsheba do she listens to the prophet She nods her head in agreement, squares her shoulders, steals her resolve, and makes her way into the king's chamber. She steps into that room lined with luxury, that room with the king's bed in the middle. She walks into that room, and when she does so, you can imagine how she would have to swallow her pride. This can't be an easy mission for her. That's her husband, his fail frame lying in the bed, him barely even able to rouse himself out of bed. And there's Abishag, young Abishag, the young beauty contest winner. She's nursing Bathsheba's husband. Remember, once upon a time, Bathsheba was that woman. Now she's on the outside of his bed, watching her place be taken by a younger model of herself. How humiliating is that? So see the humility on Bathsheba's face as she bows and pays homage to the king, giving him the honor, no matter how much she may feel otherwise. David may have forgotten about her. She may have been passed over. He may be too weak to protect her and her son, let alone the kingdom, but she will not give up. This is a woman of faith right here, friends. Bathsheba reminds David of his oath explains why she's bothering to remind him about it right now because Adonijah is king. She's careful to not blame David for being oblivious to the situation, even though the reality is that he should know what's happening, not just in his kingdom, but this is his own family. This is his own son, Adonijah. He has no excuse to not know what's going on. And she presses him gently, but she presses him. It's not too late. You can still do something to make things right. Look at verse 20. Now, my lord, the king, all the eyes of all Israel are on you. 
to tell them who shall sit on the throne of my Lord the King after him. And as Bathsheba's still talking, right on cue, in steps Nathan the prophet into the room, out of the shadows, and he affirms with his voice the truth of everything that Queen Bathsheba has been saying. Nathan says, um, King, did I miss the memo? Verse 24, my lord the king, have you said Adonijah shall reign after me and he shall sit on my throne? Because right now, even as we speak, there's a coronation party going on, king, and the shouts are ringing in the air, long live king Adonijah. Nathan says it's peace. He adds to what Bathsheba has already said, and then everybody stops. The messages have been spoken. The pleas have been made, and now they wait. How's David going to respond? How will this king respond to this crisis? Will any of this even register in that mind of his? Does David even really know where he is right now? Well, let's pick it up in verse 28 to 30. Then David answered, Call Bathsheba to me. So she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king swore, saying, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my soul out of every adversity, as I swore to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place, even so will I do this day. I love this. Then King David answered. This is huge, friend. This is huge. Go back to verse 16 for a second. When Bathsheba first steps into David's presence, remember what he said to her then? He said, what do you desire? That's in our English translations. That's actually a very generous translation of what he said in the original Hebrew, because what he actually said in Hebrew consists of all of two words. What to you? I know that's three words in English, but in Hebrew, it's only two words. What to you? Sounds like David's so far gone, he can't even spit out a complete, coherent sentence. What to you? It's a grunt. But see the transformation now. This same guy who just minutes before could barely grunt a couple of raspy syllables, suddenly he's sitting up straight and he's in full command of the facts and the situation. Let's read verses 32 to 37. King David said, call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. So they came before the king. And the king said to them, take with you the servants of your Lord and have Solomon my son ride on my own mule and bring him down to Gihon. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet there anoint him king over Israel. Then blow the trumpet and say, long live King Solomon. You shall then come up after him, and he shall come and sit on my throne, for he shall be king in my place. And I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, answered the king, Amen. May the Lord, the God of my Lord, the king, say so. As the Lord has been with my Lord the King, even so may he be with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord King David. Can't you almost see this situation? You can almost see David sitting up straight, getting out of bed, goes to his closet, puts on his old military uniform with all the stars and badges of victory, and then making his way to sit behind his desk to lay out the map, to lay out the plans, to get that pointer in his hand and point out the exact strategy that they're going to follow to make sure the right king takes his place. Solomon is going to be king, and we're going to make sure that that happens and what's going to happen right now. Remember last week when Adonijah tried to claim the throne and pass himself off as the rightful king? How he put on this air of importance. He rented himself a limousine, as it were. He hired a motorcade to drive ahead of him. So he gave off the air of inevitability and legitimacy. 
Well, look what David does here in verse 33. Solomon isn't taking a rented limo to his coronation. Dad, the king, puts him in his own royal car. He doesn't just hire a motorcade. He sends his own personal secret service to lead the processional. So they drive through the streets of Jerusalem, and as they go, a crowd gathers more and more, filling up the streets behind them. They make their way out past the walls, down the steep hill, deep into the Kidron Valley, and they make their way to Gihon. That's the water spring that supplies most of Jerusalem's water in the day. And it's about half a mile away from Adonijah's competing feast at Enrogel, which is also known as the Serpent's Stone. Interesting, applicable, appropriate name for that place, isn't it? So as soon as the group arrives at the water spring Gihon, David has the nation's two most important representatives of God anoint Solomon as king to make it all official. Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet, they're both there. Let's pick up the story in verse 39. There Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the trumpet and all the people said, long live King Solomon. And all the people went up after him, playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy so that the earth was split by their noise. So Zadok the priest takes a horn of oil from the tent. That is the tent of meeting. That's where they worship God. This is oil set apart for worship. And in an act of worship to the God who has set this people apart for himself, the unseen king over this country and the entire world, and in obedience to that God under the penetrating sunlight of the Jerusalem sun in the clear light of day before the eyes of an excited crowd of onlookers outpours the oil from the horn. See the oil pour out and down and over the head and down the beard and over the clothes of Solomon. And it's done. The torch has safely been passed to a new generation, to God's choice for leader in this new generation. Solomon is king. And the procession starts back to the city after the ceremony has taken place. The trumpets are blowing. The people are shouting, long live King Solomon. And the sound of the celebration gets louder and louder and louder. In fact, the parade becomes so loud that verse 40 tells us the earth was split by their noise. Now that's a lot of noise. That's a real celebration. And you can tell when people are sincerely excited about something as opposed to when they're just being polite or forced. Like the time when Nicolae Ceausescu, the communist dictator of Romania, gave a five hour long speech and his audience gathered together, gave him 67 standing ovations. Now, no matter how great a speech that was, and let me tell you, I have my grave suspicions as to how great that speech was. But even if it was an excellent speech, do you think by the time number five standing ovation came along, it was real enthusiasm? How about by the time you get to number 62 to 67? How much real excitement is behind those people standing and cheering? More likely, that's not about enthusiasm. That's about fear of being noticed as not being excited enough about the great and wise leader and suddenly disappearing from your family. This is not that kind of celebration here in their text. These are people who are recognizing afresh that God hasn't forgotten his people. He's provided a a ruler, a leader for their future, and with the noise loud enough to split the earth, when it's coming from a half mile away from the other party in this battle of dueling coronation celebrations, you can imagine that people at Adonijah's feast are hearing the noise. And sure enough, Joab, Adonijah's military commander, hears the trumpets. Verse 41. What does this uproar in the city mean? And Joab doesn't even get to finish his sentence before Jonathan, the son of Adonijah's priest, shows up. 
And Adonijah, who by this time in the banquet is fully limbered up, let's say, from the celebratory drinks, he's been imbibing for hours. He notices Jonathan and he welcomes him with great effluence. Verse 42, come in for you are a worthy man (coughs) and you bring good news. And we want to say, well, Adonijah, you're partly right here. Jonathan is bringing good news, that's for sure. Good news for the nation. Good news for the unfolding of God's purposes in history. But this is most certainly not good news for you, Adonijah. Verses 43 to 48. Jonathan answered Adonijah, No, for our Lord, the King David, has made Solomon king. And the king has sent with him Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and they had him ride on the king's mule. And Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him king at Gihon, and they have gone up from there rejoicing so that the city is in an uproar. This is the noise that you have heard. Solomon sits on the royal throne. Moreover, the king's servants came to congratulate our Lord King David, saying, May your God make the name of Solomon more famous than yours and make his throne greater than your throne. And the king bowed himself on the bed. And the king also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has granted someone to sit on my throne this day, my own eyes seeing it. And in the few short breaths it takes Jonathan to speak his handful of words here, Adonijah's Adonijah's entire life plan, every ambition, every dream for himself, instantly it all shatters on the cold, hard rocks of reality. All of his life he's been angling to be king. He had everything planned. Everything was organized. He had recruited his chief of staff. There was no shortage of hard work or determination in him setting out to accomplish his dreams. And he was, oh, so, so close. You could taste it. And the dad that he thought was past being able to influence a single thing, that dad, David, has now put Solomon on the throne in his place. And as soon as the reality sinks into the minds of the guests, you can imagine how the festive mood was killed in an instant. Reminds me of my fifth birthday party. Remember, that's the age when birthday parties are a big deal. You're just old enough to understand. You're not too old that you don't want to stand out. You want to be cool and only spend time with your closest of friends. No, when you are five years old, your birthday is an event that everybody's invited to. So you've got aunts and uncles and cousins. Every kid in the neighborhood is there. Kids you've barely played with. Kids that you've seen on the playground but you don't even barely know their name. Kids you don't even like. Everybody is there. And I remember at that fifth birthday party, we were getting ready for cake. We were playing pin the tail on the donkey. I don't know if that's a politically correct game to play anymore, but we played it back then. And just as mom was putting the candles on the birthday cake, some kid walked across the floor and accidentally stepped straight square in the center of the birthday cake, right on the face of my favorite clown. Now, what that cake was doing on the floor in a room full of five-year-olds, I don't quite understand. I'll have to ask mom that when I get to heaven. But what I do know very clearly is that at that point, the party was over. The footprint in the icing killed it. Because when the birthday boy is crying, the vibe is done. It's over. And Adonijah, in our text here, he's the five-year-old crying. And you can see everyone at the feast, they're looking down at their watches and starting to mutter to themselves, oh, would you look at the time? I have to go. I have to be at a a thing somewhere. Not here. And the guests all scatter. Nobody wants to be seen as a loyalist to a usurper. And Adonijah is left alone and powerless. Hear this. All you who think that life is about making your own way, 
You who think the goal of life is being a self-made man. Look at Adonijah. If ever there was a man who could have made himself, it was him. Here he is, desolate and alone, and he panics. Look at verse 50. And Adonijah feared Solomon. So he arose and went and took hold of the horns of the altar. Then it was told Solomon, behold, Adonijah fears King Solomon, for behold, he has laid hold of the horns of the altar, saying, let King Solomon swear to me first that he will not put his servant to death with the sword. See how the mighty have fallen here. Minutes ago, this man had the throne in his grasp. He was calling the shots. He was crowning himself, and he was keeping Solomon on the outside looking in. And now look at him. He's terrified. Takes sanctuary in the altar at the church, as it were, reduced to a beggar who's just pleading for life itself. And the one person in whose hands his fate rests, Solomon, is the very person he wanted to eliminate. And so now we have the first test of the newly minted king of Israel. What's Solomon going to do here? How's he going to respond to the pleas of a rival who wanted his throne and wanted he and his mother dead? What would you do if you were Solomon? Enjoy the, the juicy bit of opportunity that God has placed in your lap? Well, God must want me to wipe him out. He's put him right here in my hands. What would you do? Look at Solomon's response in verses 51 and 52. Then it was told Solomon, Behold, Adonijah fears King Solomon, for behold, he has laid horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear to me first that he will not put his servant to death with the sword. And Solomon said, If he will show himself a worthy man, not one of his hairs shall fall to the earth. But if wickedness is found in him, he shall die. So I'm not going to execute you for treason right now, but I'm also not going to pretend that you're innocent because you're not. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put you on probation, Solomon says to his brother. I'm going to let you prove yourself and your true character. I'm going to let you decide your own fate by your own actions. And if you prove loyalty... You don't even need to fear a split end at the edge of your hair. But if your actions prove treachery, you're going to have nobody but yourself to blame for your own impending death. That's Solomon's response to his first test. And if you're like me, you say, bingo, great response here. Solomon faces his first test as king, and he passes with flying colors. What wisdom and what judicious response this is. And the chapter ends in verse 53 with Adonijah led away from the altar, brought to the king. He folds down himself into visible submission. You see him there the self-promoting, ambitious son, brother, who tried to claim the throne for himself, now he's end up here, bowing before God's chosen king. Verse 53, so King Solomon sent, and they brought him down from the altar, and he came and paid homage to King Solomon. And Solomon said to him, go to your house. Go to your house. There's no mistake as to who's in control at the end of 1 Kings chapter 1. God's king is on the throne. Now, there's three things I want us to take from this text by way of application for ourselves. First thing I want is for you to see, see how the future health of God's kingdom is what stirred David to action? They brought a beautiful woman to lie in his bed to try to keep him warm, to rejuvenate his life. That didn't work. No, it was his heart for God's kingdom that roused David from bed and set him to action. And I wonder, what stirs your life? What sparks your zeal? What gets you fired up in the morning and gets you out of bed? Is it the mechanic who's looked at your car three times already, charged you shop rates for every visit, and the car still isn't running properly? Is that what fires you up? 
Is it your retirement fund and desperately trying to navigate the uncertainties of the future to make sure you've got a big enough nest egg for when you retire? Is that what fires you up? Or is it the government that lets the big box stores stay open during COVID for shoulder to shoulder boxing day shopping, but it won't let you play hockey because you're over 18 or gather in church? Whatever fires your passion, that's what reveals your heart. And if you're like me and honest with yourself, you have to admit that far too often what fires me up, what moves me to roll up my sleeves for battle, is whatever threatens my comfort. But see David in our passage. Catch his vision, friend. Let me urge you, finish well, finish well with a focus on God's purposes. And even in these times of uncertainty and even when we are not able to meet as we would like to be and it drives us crazy, don't give up and lie in your bed lifeless. View this as God's opportunity for you to minister in a brand new way and trust him to work things out according to his purposes like David did. Second thing I want you to take from our text is confidence. I want you to take confidence from 1 Kings chapter 1 in God's active direction of history. You see how much God is at work in our story here? When Adonijah stood up and said, I will be king, even though God had already made his choice known and it wasn't Adonijah, When Adonijah said, I will be king, did you notice that lightning bolt that flashed from heaven and struck that godless self-promoter right between the eyes, killing him on the spot in a spark of instant judgment? Did you like how that happened? No, that didn't happen, did it? How about when Adonijah held that feast to celebrate grabbing the throne for himself? Did you see that amazing, miraculous outbreak of food poisoning that God sent in the roast lamb that they were eating? Did you see how everyone at the dinner barely got two bites in their mouth before they started uncontrollably vomiting and running for home? So the party was over before it even began and Adonijah's schemes fell apart on the spot? Did you like that? No, no, that didn't happen either, did it? Did you notice that there is zero mention of God's activity in this story? All we get through the whole thing is human action after human action after human action. But do you see through the visible here? Do you see past what we can see with our physical eyes? Do you see how God is so perfectly in control and working out his unstoppable purposes even without a word spoken? At exactly the right time, he stirs up Nathan the prophet, gives him the right plan, exactly the right words to use for himself and for Bathsheba. See how God leads them to David at exactly the right moment in time, just when the danger was reaching its fever pitch with the imposter about ready to steal the throne, but not a moment too late. It was perfect timing. And then there's David the nearly comatose king, barely alive, can't keep himself warm, grunting out his speech, and suddenly he's sitting up straight, making plans and barking out orders to his officials. He's back to the military general and king who put Israel on the map. Where did that come from? It's not human. You see God at work here, friend. God's name may not be used in this passage as the subject of a single verb, But make no mistake, friend, the finger of God is writing history through every verse. Every verse. And he's the same God who is unfailingly and unceasingly at work in our society today. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever, Jesus said. How often do you look at the circumstances of our world unfolding around us You see everyone acting on the public stage, everyone except God, it seems. Why is his hand so invisible? 
Why do we pray for our government? We pray for elections. We pray for wisdom for those in authority over us. And we pray for the advance of the gospel. And we look around after we get up from praying and we don't seem to see the fruit anywhere. God seems to allow the events to take their course rather than answering our prayers the way that we would see fit. And we wonder, God, are you even hearing me? Remember, friend, he's working. He's working even in the darkness. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is that German pastor who's well known because of his standing up to the Nazi government in the Second World War and the days leading up to it. The one who ended ended his life in a German concentration camp, executed as a martyr just days before the end of the Second World War. That was a dark time. Western civilization at that time descended to maybe its lowest point of barbarity under the Nazis. Well, Bonhoeffer's writings from prison and through his death and martyrdom, they provide light in the dark. They did then. You've heard of Bonhoeffer before, but I don't know if you're aware that He had a sense of the role that he was called to play in God's kingdom work because in the summer of 1939, things were stirring in Europe. The Nazi government was on the march. Bonhoeffer wasn't even in Germany at the time. He was in America. And the Americans were greatly urging this great Christian leader to stay in America. He had so much to offer. He was teaching, having great success there, and they knew his life was in danger if he went back to Germany. And as Malcolm Mugridge puts it very well, if Bonhoeffer had listened to the pleadings and stayed on this side of the Atlantic, you would have had one more boring theologian with a German name. But because Dietrich Bonhoeffer was aware that he had a role in God's kingdom purposes, he knew he absolutely must be in Germany. He must suffer with the German people. He may even have had a sense that he was going to die. But in going back to Germany, into that dark time that seemed utterly hopeless for the church of Jesus Christ, Bonhoeffer provided a light in the darkness. And today, you know as well as I do, that today the Nazi party in Germany is no more and God is still building his church. God always has a light in the darkness. We are that light. And that leads me to my last life lesson for us from Adonijah's example. See Adonijah and recognize anyone who tries to sit on the throne of his own universe is one day going to end up exactly like Adonijah. Please hear this, friend. You can make your plans. You can come up with your schemes. You can work the system. You can promote yourself. You can say, not your will be done, God, but my will is what I want done. And you might get away with it for a while. Teenagers, young adults, please hear this. You feel invincible right now. And you may be having right now a time of partying where it seems like you are making your own rules and the friends around you are cheering you on. You are the king of your universe. But there will come a day, friend. There will come a day, and it's coming much sooner than you think, when your star will fade, your friends will leave you alone, and all the pleasures that you demanded for yourself, they will all turn to gravel between your teeth. Ask Adolf Hitler. Tried to rule the world, looked like he was going to get away with it, and he ended up a suicide. Ask Howard Hughes, richest man in the world of his day, who died alone in his self-imposed prison cell of a luxury apartment with Kleenex boxes on his hands and feet to protect himself from germs. Better yet, ask yourself, how well has life worked out for you when you've tried to sit on the throne of your own life? when you've tried to live on your own terms, thinking you know better than God and you should serve you, not him first? Have you tasted freedom's joy and found the fulfillment that you were created, designed by God to know? Or have you found in your times of putting yourself on the throne that all the promises that this world has to offer are empty? 
empty. There's nothing there. Of course they'll be empty. Because God didn't create you to be king. You're too small a king to satisfy your own desires. He didn't design you to grab for your own glory because that's too big a burden for you and no one can ever fully do that. God designed you, friend, to surrender to the king of kings, to Jesus Christ, the eternal king who is also the son of God. In living surrender to him, if you do that, you will find your purpose And you'll be able to live with the unshakable confidence that God is answering your prayer that his kingdom would come. Even when you can't see it with your eyes, you can know he's working his purposes and he's using you. Sure must have seemed foolish to have any confidence in Jesus Christ as anything more than a tragic tale of a teacher wiped out when he hung on the cross. Who would have thought that this dying, crucified criminal really was the king of the Jews as it said above his cross, let alone the king of kings and savior of the world. And when that message of this crucified king was proclaimed, most people laughed right from the beginning. And yet God's people throughout history have had unswerving confidence that God will not leave his people lost in a world of bad actors. He will build his church. And he's been doing it for 2,000 years. And he's not going to stop now. Would you trust him? Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you. Thank you for your word that though written so long ago and in a very different context, speaks so completely relevantly to us today. Thank you that you have not left us here to flounder in this world. Thank you that you have not surrendered history to those with the greatest reach and the most determination to set their own agendas, but you are building your church. And throughout history, your people have found themselves at points where the future looked bleak indeed. And yet you have never let your hand relax. You are doing your work. You are guiding history. And you have blessed us in Jesus Christ with the ability to trust in confident hope and joy that the future means you building more of your kingdom, crowning on that glorious day when our Savior, risen and glorified, comes back for his own to make all things right once and for all. Help us to live in light of that day, in our day. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Team, would you come lead us in a closing hymn?